Good morning. All right. Could you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We're thankful to be a part of your family. Thank you, Jesus, for the work which you have finished, begun and finished for us on the cross. We rest complete in you, and we're so thankful for uh, the freedom of freedom and joy of life in fellowship with the Father. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I know it's Father's Day. I wasn't aware it was gonna, I was gonna be preaching on Father's Day <clears throat> until just a little bit ago, so I do not have a necessar- necessarily a Father's message, although fathers are definitely welcome to listen in, right? <laughs> just along with everybody else. It is a message about the goodness of our Father, and I'm hoping that we can all learn thereby. So if you've gotten a new toy, a new car, a new house, and there's something about the newness of it that, that is exciting, right? That, that, that we're happy about. And the first time use is always a lot of fun. Uh, incidentally, my wife just got a new cookware set at Costco and we broke it out, was it yesterday? Or Friday night or something like that, so we sit on, she sets it on the counter, we pull these things out, got, fry that first egg, boil that first pot of potatoes in the new cookware set. There's something about that that's cool. But sooner or later that kind of wears off, right? And it's not new anymore. It just, it just is. It functions in whatever, whatever capacity we, we purchased it to function in. We see a lot of times, not all the time, but there are Christians that can be robbed of their new joy as well in life. And so we wonder, why do Christians get robbed of joy? How does that work? Why does it fade a lot of times? We're gonna be looking at Colossians chapter two today. Uh, I kind of studied through Colossians a while ago And my hope was to work through Colossians chapters two and three today, but I got stuck in chapter two. Um, Elliot also asked me to keep the message very short. And I said, well, what if God wants me to keep it very long? And he didn't have a good answer for that, but needless to say, we're not gonna get through both chapters chapters today. I'm excited about this, and I think there'll be something for us to learn here. And, and, and two, two things kind of. So my one question was, why, why do Christians get robbed of joy, and what can we do to, to prevent that? And, and two, seemingly, a seemingly unrelated question is, why are there people being led away to deception, and how can I be confident that I'm not deceived? I am 100% sure that all of us sitting in, in this room know that we're not deceived, right? That'll be the case 20 years from now as well. But how can I be sure? And Jesus through Paul speaks about this and, and a bit of the, the, the prevention of deception. So what does my joy and deception have in common anyways? Well hopefully we'll, we'll draw a little bit of parallel there. So. The title here is Captivated by Christ, and that is a key, obviously, Captivated by Christ. So a bit of a background on the book of Colossians. Uh, it was written from, from prison by Paul. Colossi was likely, Paul was like, likely never visited, likely never saw the believers in, in Colossae. Um, it was probably started by one of his, one of his uh, possibly one, someone that learned from him. Epaphras was from this church, so that's a likely candidate to have started this church and continued it. So these people probably never saw Paul from what we can gather from this book. Uh, It seems like most of the believers in the church were probably Gentiles based on the location of the church and some of the things that are mentioned in the book. It's pretty clear that this was was written to to a, a majority Gentile church. And the problem that Paul was encountering or trying to trying to speak against and help them through was that they were being moved by Judaizers who had come and said, you need Christ and something else. They were also being moved by uh, popular 
uh, cultural shifts of the day. Right? So Greek, Greek philosophers and their theories about, about uh, life and where it comes from and where we're going and those kinds of things. So it was kind of two things. There were the traditions of the Jews and Judaizers and there were the popular cultural things of the day which, which the church was really being kind of moved around by. The real problem underneath of that, and that, that's kind of what we can encounter with most problems, right? We kind of have a surface problem. It's important for us to ask some why questions to dig below that a lot of times. And it seems like the real problem they had, which Paul uncovers, is they didn't have a clear understanding of Jesus as the head of all things Christian and of his complete work for them. They were being convinced, allowing themselves to be convinced, that Jesus was good, but possibly insufficient, and no, probably no one ever said that, right? But that's just kinda how it was happening, and, and they were beginning to trust other things. So chapter one, he starts in with thanksgiving and prayer, goes through a poem of, of Christ and his, his, his high position and, and who he was, and then digs into chapter two, and so we're going to go ahead and dig into chapter two as well. I'm gonna have you stand a couple of times here throughout as we read portions of the, of the chapter, so please stand with me, and I'm gonna read uh, verses one through four. I'll read from the, from the ESV. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. <gasps> oh, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Okay, you may be seated. Paul, has a, Paul does a good job of going through these like, long sentences with a lot of stuff in them. And that's what we see here. <clears throat> in the beginning of chapter two. So, you know, if I'd ask you, can you unpack for me verses, uh, verses two and three, just quickly, it's like, uh, give me a minute, right? Let me reread it, let me reread it. Let me, let me figure this out a little bit and I'll try to unpack it for you. Uh, before we do that, what I'm thinking of, so I asked mom to bring a road map with her this morning, I brought it along. I haven't seen one of these for a long time. You know what I was gonna do, I forgot. I was gonna, I was gonna ask anybody 10 years or younger to, to tell me what this was. <laughs> My boys asked me this morning, what, what is that? It's a road atlas, it's a map, right? We're familiar with those things. I remember going out to job sites when I was an older teen. We, like you, you go back to the road index and you look for the right road name and you hope, you, you know, it's there, it's there and you find it and then you go to the page that it references and then you coordinate, okay, you find the road and then you gotta find out what block you wanna go to, right? It's like you're your own GPS kind of thing. So without a map, so thinking of getting lost in the dark, let's think of an ideal getting lost situation in the dark. Uh, or getting lost situation. It's probably gonna be dark, it's probably gonna be raining cats and dogs, you probably have a lot of backseat drivers, um, you have no map, and you don't know where you are, right? That's a good chance you're, you, you are lost there and lost because of these, all these external factors playing on you. You don't know where you are. Interesting thing is, if you have the map, or now a phone, obviously, if you have a map, all those external factors can remain the same. It can still be dark, it can still be cats and dogs, you can still have a lot of backseat drivers and all of those things, but you have the map, you know where you are, right? You have the coordinates, you see your destination, you see where you come from, and you know where you're going. That's really the difference maker. And we'll see here, these people were being moved by those external influences, by those kind of other parties, and being distracted and losing focus on the map, which of course is Jesus Christ in this, in this, uh, in this analogy. <clears throat> Okay, a couple, of, a couple of words here in the beginning. So it says that they may be knit together, that their hearts may be knit, comforted, being knit together in love. And that being knit together is one word, kind of one phrase in the Greek, and it's interesting. It kind of has the idea of putting two and two together with your reasoning, right? We've heard, we've heard that phrase, he put two and two together. It's like, you didn't understand something, and all of a sudden you took two seemingly disparate facts, and you put them together, and you have a light bulb moment. It's like, aha, that's what this means, that's what this is. That's what Paul is saying here. 
being knit together. You're putting facts together to come to a certain conclusion. So as I see, once you to come to the conclusion, what conclusion? To the acknowledgement. So that your hearts may be knit together, come to a conclusion in love, and you must understand the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. When you understand God's mystery, which is Jesus, as we've seen in other places, and here he uses it again, Jesus, God's mystery, you will gain spiritual riches, and, verse four, you will not be deluded with plausible arguments, or like the King James says, you will not be beguiled with enticing words. Now, the word there in verse two, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, that's more than just a knowing, it's a full knowledge and a full understanding, a thorough knowledge of something. You know, I'm surprised again and again when I listen to somebody who's an expert in a given field, the depth of knowledge that's out there in any kind of thing. I have a guy that works for me who is, uh, who's big into fishing. He's a bass fisher. He's, he travels doing fishing. Uh, one of his goals was to fish with a pro this year. I listen to him talk about fishing. I, my mind is blown away. It's like, how, there's so much knowledge that I knew nothing about, right? When you dig into that. Uh, same thing with steam engines. I had the, the privilege of riding with Ross on his steam engine. And this guy is like, the steam engine encyclopedia, and I never even knew there was an encyclopedia, right? It's just incredible all the knowledge that's out there. And God is saying, I want you to understand everything about my mystery so you will not be beguiled with enticing words. Now the thing about plausible arguments and enticing words is, it sounds good, right? It's reasonable. That's why it's important to know God's mystery because unless you have a higher knowledge than the plausible argument, you're gonna go with it. That's the whole thing of deception. You're gonna go with it because it sounds great unless you have a higher knowledge which supersedes that and you can look down from above as it were and see, see the holes in it and see that it's not plausible. One interesting side note, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That word treasures is our root word for thesaurus. You think of a thesaurus as a treasure book, right? You go to look one, one word up and it's got this treasure trove of 100 words that are synonymous with that word. That's kind of the, 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 uh, what's going on here. So we need that higher knowledge of the mystery of Christ to prevent deception. Now, children are typically more easily beguiled than adults most of the time, and Jesus speaks about the importance of not leading them astray, right? Don't take advantage of children and lead them astray. That person should be punished, as Jesus said. I think of back in the day, especially in the 1800s, we have, now we call a snake oil salesman somebody who's pretty sleazy, slimy, you don't wanna deal with, right? Back in the 1800s, there were these snake oil salesmen who came around smelling snake oil, but there was no regulation of, of, of any value back then as far as, you know, it has to have this kind of content to be able to market in this fashion. You could say whatever you wanted to say, and for many years, people were deceived by these snake oil salesmen who were selling this special oil as, as uh, as having special properties because it comes from, I didn't dig into all the, all the chemistry of it and everything, but some properties from a snake, right? Well, a lot of these people were found out in the early 1900s when the FDA began regulating these things and began checking the, the, the substances and stuff. All these guys, there were lawsuits because they were snake oil salesmen. They were selling water, they were selling juice, like stuff that didn't have any snake in it. And so that happened back then. And it happened because people did not, did not have a higher knowledge to go by, right? All they knew was what this guy told them. They didn't have Google to go and look it up. They didn't have a knowledgeable doctor to go to. It's like, this is what you're telling me? I oh, gotta believe it, I don't have a higher knowledge. God says, I don't want you to be taken over by a snake oil salesman. You need higher knowledge so it doesn't look plausible, so you're not beguiled. <clears throat> Now here, it wasn't snake oil, but it was the snake oil, we could say, of, of the traditions of the Jews and the philosophies of the Greeks. 
And the Jews especially had a lot of clout in their snake oil. Like this stuff came from God, right? We'll see later on. So Paul says here in the beginning, you haven't seen me in the flesh. That shouldn't hinder your faith. It's not me that you're trusting. God wants you to have full understanding of his wisdom so that what looks beguiling, what looks plausible from earth looks plainly erroneous from above. Isn't that what we want? So how do we come to this full understanding? What does that look like? Well, there's a couple of things that he points out. Firstly, in verse six, therefore, and this is a, 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 an often quoted verse, therefore as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So walk as you began. As you entered the path, so continue. And there are a couple of things that we consider, okay, how did we enter this path? What was it like? He says, walk as you began, as you received Christ. When we received Christ, we had full trust and assurance and belief in the person of Christ Jesus, in his work. Absolute and total trust and belief in his atonement. And no, it's not blind faith necessarily, I kind of think blind faith is a bit of an oxymoron. Um, you know, we say we just gotta step out in blind faith and we kind of apply that to Christianity sometimes. Which, when you think about it, faith, we probably say that because there's a verse that says we go by faith, not by sight. But that sight in that verse is talking about physical like things here and there. Real faith is spiritual sight, right? It's seeing something certainly, knowing for sure that this is what it is and stepping out. It's not blind faith. And so we, had, we were convinced of our sinfulness when we first began the journey. So convinced, saw it so clearly that we stepped forward in that faith and in that sight. We also had full understanding of my unrighteousness and Christ's absolute righteousness, my inheritance of that, of his righteousness, and my inheritance of my unrighteousness, right? From birth and by deed. And, importantly, we had full and complete abandonment of my own way. Absolute abandonment of my own way in deference to Christ, in full obedience to Christ. Now he says here, he, he uses three different, kind of three different uh, things. He says, walk in him, rooted, which is talking about a plant or a tree, being rooted in him, and being built up as a building. So it's Three different word pictures he gives us. As you entered the way, as you entered the gate, so walk. Stripped of yourself, nothing but me. Here's what I am. As you started, as, were, as you were planted, let your roots grow down so that you might bear fruit. And be built up on the foundation, the foundation that was laid, which is Christ. Now, he says, abounding in thanksgiving, isn't it reasonable to be thankful for the absolute, complete work of Christ Jesus? Christ is the king of the universe, God incarnate. Consider that. Shouldn't thankfulness be the, ab be the, be the natural result of this? Amen. Absolutely. Paul says um, that I give my body, it's, it's my reasonable service to give my entire body to God, right? Because of what he's done for me. <clears throat> our hearts are full of thanksgiving when we consider and focus on the work and person of Jesus Christ. We'll get into that a little bit more here later. So he says, walk as you began. In full confidence in Christ, no agenda of my own, that's it. Verse eight, so verse eight is kind of a, kind of a verse that he sticks in there and, and says, here's what I'm gonna talk about. So he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. He says, don't be robbed by what's rightfully yours. Don't let the teachings of men 
the traditions of men, the philosophies around you, don't let that take away what is rightfully yours in Christ. All right, could you stand with me again? We're gonna read verses nine through 15. So then he goes into, from the verse eight, he goes into this description of Jesus Christ and his work. Again, he's trying to defeat the other things which are diverting the attention of the people and taking their faith off of Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Thank you, you can be seated. So the first point he says here, in verse eight, and I have labeled it or I've titled it, don't be plundered by the world. Don't be plundered by the world, by its philosophies, by its ways of thinking. Like I said, um, Greek philosophers there had kind of come up there were a lot of different opinions about the world and, and our function in it and where we were going and so forth, but it seems like one theology, one um, perspective that was coming and, and pulling Christians away was the, was the, uh, the belief of, of Gnosticism, and that was basically, um, again, varying beliefs within that system, but but at its basic form, the belief was that my body is evil, my spirit is inherently good. And so some people were taking that, it's like, I don't care what, my body's evil, it doesn't matter what I do with my body, my spirit's gonna be good anyways, it's gonna be saved. Other people were buffeting their bodies and being all ascetic about it, right? Because they wanna to try to bring this evil body into alignment with something good. And so Paul seems to be seeking, speaking somewhat against that heresy of like this big separation between body and spirit. And we know from the New Testament over and over again, our body and spirit, our spirit indwells our body and, and God calls us to be temples, have our bodies as temples of his Holy Spirit. So that was, those are some of the worldly things going on back then. If we look at today, what are, some of the, what are some of the ways that the world is interpreting God's truth for us or maybe changing it a bit? And I think this is what we need to be careful of. There are lots of different things that Satan wants to twist and, and, and try to make us believe some form of, of of the Bible with a little bit of, of falsity in it. Um, but again, think of beguiling, enticing words. That's what Paul's working against here. What, what sounds like a plausible argument regarding um, our belief system as, you know, from, from the world's perspective? Something that comes up a lot, especially now, and we saw it on the, board, on, the, on the screen this morning, is the word tolerance, right? Love and tolerance. <clears throat> There's, there's an uncritical tolerance that abounds in this nation. A tolerance that says, truth doesn't matter, it matters more about what I feel. And it's funny because the very tolerant people become very intolerant of other people who don't think like they do. It's like, I'll be tolerant if you're tolerant to me, but if not, I'm not gonna be tolerant. That's not tolerance, right? So it doesn't make sense to begin with. But that is an, that, that's a statement that we hear all over the place. So the focus becomes that, and love becomes interpreted as good feelings. Feeling good about myself, feeling good about somebody else. That's not, that's not what love, that's not the foundation of love. It's not good feelings. I think because a lot of the world is focused on feeling good, that can bleed into the church in various ways, but it kind of, what it, what it seems to do is it, it, it kind of breeds an experience-based Christianity. And I think we'd do well to be careful of that. Yes, there are experiences, important experiences in the Christian life. And that's good. But if our Christian life is only those feel-good experiences, and that's what comprises our faith, 
That's a worldly influence that we need to be aware of. I think of the, the, the focus on uh, a worship experience at church. That's good and right, and I experience worship when we worship here together, and I'm glad for that. But I think some of the church has taken that influence from the world and said we need this experience, we need this love, good feeling, and it's that worship experience that becomes the focus. Again, that's, that, that's, that's leading away, that can lead away from Christ. Let it not be so here. How about this, a good life or material success is God's blessing. It's easy for us to say, man, the Lord's blessed me, you know? Um, whether it's financially, whatever, good things. And yes, while that's true, God has blessed us with many good things. If I have, okay, so in my instance, I run a business. I can look at that and say, this is a blessing from the Lord. That, that, or what I'm trying to say is that is his approval on my life, right? I'm doing what, I, what he wants me to do because my business is flourishing. I don't, I don't really think so. Uh, there are many people who have flourishing enterprises who are not being blessed of God, right? In other ways, who are non-Christians. So, so the thing is, I want to be careful with assigning God's blessing on my life as resulting from, now what am I trying to say? What? As evidence evidence of my life with him, right? It's not that all my material things that that look successful mean that I have a great relationship with God. That's not necessarily true, so we need to be careful of that. Paul in 1 Corinthians um, chides the people there. He says, look folks, you guys are living like kings. I wish you were kings, then I could live with you. But he says, I am buffeted, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm without a place. That's, that's a lot of what we see in the New Testament Christian life. And that goes in the face of the world looking at all these, all the abundance of material possessions and saying, yeah, that's a blessing from God. Let's be careful with that. So here in this passage, verses nine through 15, moving on a bit. Sorry, before I do that, just to summarize here so far, those are worldly influences, right? Those are philosophies of the world that can overtake us if we're not careful. Let's stand for absolute truth, let's stand for morality, let's stand for the things of the word of God, regardless of what's around us. Paul makes it very clear that Christ rules supreme, and that Christ has preeminence in all of life. So in verses nine through 15, the mystery, so he wants us to understand the mystery of Christ so that we are not led astray. And he unpacks that for us in a couple of ways. First, he is superior in nature. He is superior in nature. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, fully man, fully God. And you are filled in him. King James says you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Very God himself, the deity and divinity in me. He is superior in position. Says he is the head of all principality and power. And we heard that a bit this morning, above the angels as a position of son. He has a natural right to ownership. He is superior in his work. That's verses 11 and 12. In whom also ye are circumcised and baptized with him. He has worked a complete work. Performing the circumcision of the heart completely. And it's thorough. It's complete. It's inside out. That's what's one thing that Jesus was, was, was uh, concerned about when he was here among us was I work from the inside out. Don't try cleaning up the outside. Clean up the inside. God has, he's done that completely. He's cleaned us from the inside out. Putting off the body of flesh, the sinful nature, not just sins, not just the forgiveness of sins, but putting off the entire sinful nature. The godly for the ungodly. 
Righteousness for unrighteousness and love for hate. He is superior in his work and the completion of it. In his offering, in the offering for that work. So we have a a crucifixion reference here. Verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. You were dead in your sins. He's quickened you, having forgiven your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So back in that day, crucifixion was well understood. If you remember when Jesus was crucified, what did Pilate put above Jesus uh, on the top of the cross? What did he nail up there? The king of the Jews. Jews. What did the Jews want to put up there? He said he's the king of the Jews. So back then, they would always nail the charges against the person on the cross. So the thieves probably had this guy as a robber, whatever, you know? Those were the charges, whatever it was, whatever that list of things was that condemned them to the cross, that would be displayed for everybody to see. So it really didn't make sense from the Jews' perspective to put up their king of the Jews. The charges actually are, are that he said he was the king of the Jews. That's what condemns him to death, because he's lying, right, in their mind. But no, that's not what, what Pilate put up there. So we are held in derision by a debt from birth. You know, imagine being born with, a, just, just, just for being born, you have a million dollar debt on your head. Well, that, that wouldn't feel too good. And then you go through life and babies are expensive, right? You rack up more and more and more debt as you go through, not paying any of it off. Soon, and this is almost the case where the United States is, not quite, but soon you can't even pay the interest on your debt. Isn't that bad? You can't, you, you, you can't pay the principal at all, and you don't even have money to pay the, the interest of the debt. And that's, that's what it's like here. It's like, it's impossible to crawl out of this. It's an impossible scenario to be in. We were buried in debt because of this body of flesh, this sinfulness that we inherited. And it's all been recorded by an expert accountant. Now, no, nothing against accountants, right? We need great accountants. But Satan is the accountant in this scenario, and he's recorded everything. He's got the whole list. And so think of your cross, you're condemned to die, and your list is long, right? And Satan's recorded it all. Every sin leaves its mark on the tablet of our hearts. I think it's good for us to consider this. It's etched in stone. And maybe you're here and you're not converted. You haven't surrendered to Christ. And it could be easy for us to sin and look back and say, oh, no consequences, I can't see anything. It's almost like your life, with our lives, we're writing with invisible ink, and sooner or later, it's all gonna appear. What's it gonna look like? It's all going to be there. So Jesus comes and erases it, cleans the slate. That's justification. That handwriting of ordinances, the thing that should have nailed me to the cross and should have been at the top of the cross saying here's why he was condemned to die. Jesus took it away, took that debt. And he concludes here and says that your debt holders your legal owner, Satan, as it were, the accounting's handwriting of ordinances, all of that, they've got a case that's completely fallen apart. It's like the prosecutor comes up to the stand and calls for the evidence and it's not there anymore, none of it. And he says he makes a case of them openly in verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And isn't that truly a show where Satan has us buried in debt, nailed to the cross, and Satan takes care of that, and right when he, right when he thinks he's got us, it's all gone, 100% of it. And so what Paul is getting at here is he wants us to be captivated by who Christ is in his fullness. We have been buried with him. We have been raised with him. We've been forgiven by him. He has erased that debt. It truly is the great exchange. We take all the rewards of his position, all of them, 
and he takes all the blame for ours. All of it. Be captivated by Christ. And in that captivation, life and victory and thankfulness and safety from deception will be realized. Number two, so we looked at the philosophies of the world and the influence that they can have on us. We've looked at the fullness and complete work of Christ. And three, sorry, don't be plundered. So don't be plundered by the world and its philosophies. Don't be plundered by performance metrics is what I put here. Don't be plundered by performance metrics. So verses 16 through the end. If you don't mind, stand with me one more time. Take a stretch and a yawn. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up, with, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Thank you, you can be seated. So four times here in this chapter, Paul says, let no one, let no one, do not be. He says, let no one take you captive up, up further. Here he says, let no one disqualify you. So again, these people were being told, you really should do this or that or the other thing to be fully accepted and justified by God. Those people, Paul has a reference, Paul has a, a word picture for them. In 1 Timothy, he says their consciences have been seared with a hot iron. Everybody, anybody ever get seared by a hot iron? That's what God says happened to these people, who, these Judaizers. It was the same, same things in, in 1 Timothy. Um, Sabbaths, new moons, and things like that. He's like, these guys' consciences have been seared by a hot iron. I find that a, a, a great illustration, a great way to put it. It's like their, con their conscience is gone. The, 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 the God reasoning part of them is gone and all they're left with is human reasoning. <clears throat> so he has here a couple of shadows, he calls them. Food and drink. So obviously it's big in the Jewish community, right? No pork, don't eat that, don't eat this, be careful about that, wash your hands, right? And that was given, that was given by God in the Old Testament as a way to stay clean, cleanliness. So that was the shadow of something to come, he's saying. And obviously we know Christ is our full and complete and ongoing cleansing, and so he's saying, the food and drink doesn't matter anymore. That was simply a shadow of Christ. That was pointing to something coming. That something has come in Christ Jesus. It's not food and drink anymore. Festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. Again, something that was commanded by the Lord in the Old Testament, in the law, to observe and to keep, not in perpetuity we find, but until the coming of Christ. Christ is our Passover. Christ is our Pentecost, the fulfillment of the law. Christ is our high priest in the tabernacle. All these things had feasts and holy days built around them, right, to represent the coming of Christ. The thing is, these traditions of the Jews, which, were try which these people were accepting, were commanded by God. These guys had a lot of clout. I feel like they had a lot of ground to stand on. And it would be easy to say, hey, you know, it might not be necessary, but it certainly can't hurt. Like, it is in the Bible, right? It is in the Old Testament. God did say this. So, hey, why not? Let's plug that in here. 
Paul says, don't do it. Don't do it. Why not? Now, if it was just verse, if it was just like verses 17 or like 18, so asceticism, worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, like for me, I can look at that and say, yeah, definitely stay away from that. <clears throat> but verse 16, food and drink, festivals, new moons, a Sabbath, like that's some pretty big stuff to say just don't do it, get rid of it, because these are, like that, that hits a little closer home to me. Again, remember, they were being told, do this to gain full acceptance with God as part of your justification. God stresses that nothing, nothing comes in the way of the gospel, of the good news in our lives. It's here, the whole book of Galatians, some of Ephesians, books of the Bible, where God is super concerned that nothing be added to the simplicity of the good news of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. That's it. And that's what needs to hold our attention and our focus, completely and totally. It's kind of like, you know, like the Mona Lisa, right? The, probably the most valuable painting in the world. It's like strolling into the Louvre in, 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 in Paris with your paintbrush and taking a dab at the Mona Lisa and trying to dress it up. Is that gonna dress it up? No way, that's gonna devalue it. Right? Or trying to do that and then take it to, to, to win an art competition. It doesn't work that way. It is full and complete in itself. I touch it, it's damaged. Obviously we know Christ's gospel isn't gonna be damaged. But God is saying, do not pollute my gospel with anything. And that's especially important for us in ministry. It's easy, for, we need to be very clear on this in ministry and recognize there is a core of the gospel. I don't want to add to it. I don't want to take away from it. Paul is stressing here in Colossians the importance of protecting that core, that fundamental core of the gospel with nothing else on top of it. And it's interesting, I, I think we, and I'll say we as a church, um, we can be quick to distance ourselves from things, from practices that would lead to what I'll call Gentile sins, right? In this, in this, in this case, thinking of Gentile sins as kind of being worldly things. What struck me here in the study of this chapter, and the question that I'm left with is, what, what about practices that lead to or are used by others as performance metrics to gain acceptance with God? or the Jewish sins, I'll call them. We don't tend to lay as much focus on those, but that's what Paul is cutting at here, and in Galatians, do not touch it. What good performance metrics or relationship savers are we in danger of being disqualified by, of losing the prize? Of course we know that there's you know, other passages that talk. So he says here, if they try to force you to not eat this food or not do that drink, don't do it. Well, but then in, in Romans chapter 14, Paul says, I won't eat meat while the world stands if it offends my brother, right? Ah, offends my brother. That's the difference. He says, I won't put a stumbling block in front of my brother or an occasion to fall. And if my meat eating will do that, I won't do it. He doesn't say the preference of my brother, he says a stumbling block, something that makes my brother fall. As in, I'm the cause of his sin. That, that word occasion to fall there is, in the Greek it was, it was the, the little trigger or stick on a trap, right? So you have a trap set, like a mouse trap, and you got cheese on the little trigger. Right, and as soon as it touches the cheese and hits the trigger, ksh, the trap falls. That's what Paul was saying in, in Romans chapter 14. He's like, don't be the stake, don't be the trigger that makes someone fall into sin. So I think the, the, the overarching law with this, or principle, the law of Christ really is others first. And it seems like from what I'm getting here, and in Galatians, and trying to balance that with other scriptures, 
it's, it's not necessarily their preferences and performance metrics, but it's their well-being. So obviously God wants us to be co- cons- mostly concerned with the well-being of others, right? Put others ahead of yourself. I want your well-being to be first. But when it comes to performance metrics, I'll call it, he says don't have anything to do with it. Don't touch it. So like I said in ministry, this should make us cautious about what we impose on other Christians, on new believers especially. A question we can bring in cases where we might, where we might be unsure of whether or not you know, something should or should not be done, does it point us to the all-sufficiency of Christ or towards the works of man? All right, verse 19 he says, you're not holding fast to the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. You're not holding fast to the head, why? Because you're holding on to something else. You're holding on to the fast, you're holding on to the new moon, you're holding on to the Sabbath, you're holding on to no pork, you're holding on to whatever it is, If you're holding on to that, you can't be holding fast to the head, which is Christ. If you're holding on to anything else as a part of your salvation or Christian identity, then we're losing our grip on the head, which is Christ. So going back to what we started with in verse six, all we need is to walk as we began, our full belief and trust in the atonement of Christ, full understanding of my unrighteousness and his righteousness and the exchange, and full abandonment of my way and wisdom. That is human reasoning. Those are the other things. And we find that when we are captivated in Christ, when we keep our minds set on this, this concept here of Christ and his finished work, That is the mystery of God worked in our salvation. He says again in verse 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why are you submitting to these regulations? Now I'm not saying with this that we need to cast off all restraint. But I think what God wants us to see here is that we need to have a very clear definition of where our justification comes from. And maybe even push us a little bit further in the direction of let's not, let's not just do stuff to keep the peace or to, because um, I think like it could have been a very valid argument in this day and time for one of these Christians to have said look, there's nothing wrong with, with not eating pork, right? That's, that, that's fine, like, I don't have to eat pork, I'll be fine. Paul said, he didn't say eat pork here, but he said don't go with it, do not go there. And I don't know where that application is exactly for all of us, it's gonna be at different places. But I think it is very critical that we don't, um, that we don't allow these things to obfuscate or in any way take away our hold on the head of the body, which is Christ. Unless you're holding to him alone, unless you're captivated by his work and his righteousness, we might risk being led away or deceit. There's comfort in the fact that if I hold to Christ alone, this is the mystery of God worked out in my life, and I will not be led astray. When our justification or um, our focus even begins to stray off of Christ onto some of these other things, then we need to beware and get back to that. So maybe when a new doctrine is encountered or a twist of some kind, some kind is encountered, right? We all come across these teachings and, and so forth. And it's like, oh, is that, de- is that deceptive? Is that real? Is it true? Is it not? Our question should not only be, does it align with the Bible or with this scripture? Is it, you know, good, you know, does it align with scripture? But am I holding fast to Christ? 
We see a lot of people who've become distracted and that's what leads to deception. So in encountering new teachings, we shouldn't be afraid of them, but the question should be, am I holding fast to the head? Am I captivated by the fullness and the complete work of Christ in my life? Now, a good indicator of that is your thankfulness. And this is where joy comes in. I think one of the reasons Paul mentions again and again, be thankful, is because, yes, it's good to actually be thankful, but that is an indicator of where our heart is. When we are captivated by Christ and his full and complete work, will we not be thankful every day? Will we not live in joy when we see our sinfulness and his righteousness and the great exchange? Certainly our hearts will be full of thanksgiving and joy. And so Paul says, be thankful. And that is the indicator of our, the position of our heart. So when we're living in thanksgiving, we can look at it kind of as a, as a thermometer. When we're living in the fullness and the reality of Christ, thankfulness will be our life. Joy will be our life. That's why it's important. That's why I think he focuses on this is because it is an indicator of where our heart is. And so when we're thankful and full of joy, we can be certain that our completion is in Christ and we can be certain that we're not gonna be led astray by the winds of doctrine that come around. I found this short poem um, as I was studying. Again, just looking at Christ and his fullness. He is a path if any be misled. He is a robe if any naked be. If any chance to hunger, he is bread. If any be a bondsman, he is free. If any be but weak, how strong he is. To dead men, life is he. To sick men, health. To blind men, sight. And to the needy, wealth. A pleasure without loss. A treasure without stealth. Truly Christ is all in all. And let us not lose our focus of that. So I think the challenge for me in, in going away from this study of, of this second chapter, and there's a couple. One is to be very careful in how I teach the Christians around me. Um, another is to not just go along with something good that has a heavy attachment to performance in Christianity, even if it looks okay, because I think there's something here where God's like, I, I don't want that, just, just keep it clean, keep it free. Um, and thirdly, learning that my attitude of thankfulness and joy is an indicator of what's in my heart. And to use that as my temperature gauge, may we always be thankful, may we always be joyful. When we're not, let's turn our, to our focus and attention back on Christ as the fullness of our salvation, and therein is safety. Amen.